This episode is sponsored by Horizon Capital, an M&A and micro-private equity firm that acquires and grows SaaS companies. Horizon Capital only works with SaaS companies generating between 500K and 5 million in annual recurring revenue, where they help them unlock the true value of their business and scale to the next level. Whether you're ready to move on to your next startup or want to work with the right growth partner, Horizon's team will work with you to find the best structure possible. From M&A strategy to capital investments, SaaS is all they do. Simple as that. If you're a SaaS founder with less than $5 million in annual recurring revenue and are looking to sell your business, visit horizoncapital.com today and get a free valuation. If you'd like to sponsor the SaaS District podcast or recommend any guests that you think would be valuable to be on the show, visit horizoncapital.com slash SaaS dash podcast today. Thanks again, folks. Hello, hello, everyone. This is your host, Akil Jabbar, and welcome back to another episode of SaaS District. In today's episode, we'll be talking about how to reduce and manage your SaaS data security risk and privacy compliance. Today, we have our guest, Darren Gallup, joining us. Darren is a business leader and security professional with over 20 years of experience as a CEO and CISO of companies that handle sensitive data and is based out of Nova Scotia, Canada. Having founded a nonprofit organization, three service companies, and two tech startups in his career, he understands how to assess and manage risk in alignment with organizational goals. Darren is also a tech entrepreneur, information security expert, Techstars alumni, board member, and the CEO of Securacy. He co-founded Securacy, Securacy and led the team to develop a SaaS product that guides businesses through creating, implementing, and manages their information security pri- and privacy compliance program. Uh, Darren previously co-founded Marcato and was the CEO there for 10 years until the company was acquired by Patreon Technologies. Uh, so Darren most, uh, sorry, Darren most of the time spends most of his non-work time playing music, fly fishing, canoeing, gardening, and roasting coffee. So welcome, Darren. Glad to have you on SAS District today. Hey, glad to be here. <laughs> awesome. So I uh, just want to start you know, directly with your background and let's get into some failures. So I want to hear about the story, which you mentioned was around how at a previous SaaS company you started, you lost a six-figure deal after the company that uh, couldn't prove a strong security posture. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, yeah. I don't forget that one easily. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So basically, uh, basically what happened was, uh, you know, we were a small SaaS company. We were selling a festival management platform and we were mostly originally selling to very small festivals, um, regional festivals around Canada and whatnot. And then, you know, all of a sudden we just started to hit this, this sort of streak of big festivals we signed some big ones like Coachella and Bonnaroo and stuff like that. And, and, and along with that, um, it, it just really quickly had had these larger corporate organizations coming in that own festivals like AEG, Live Nation, Disney, and, and organizations of this sort. And and in in that uh, you know in the second round of all of that exciting uh, business coming our way, we had a really big vendor in Europe that would have taken uh, would have brought in something around sixteen or seventeen major festivals. Um, they sent a security questionnaire to us. Um, it was very detailed. They were obviously very concerned and just wanted to make sure that all of the data they were collecting was was what was being well looked after and and we, we just really you know we a very tight time cycle in terms of selling a festival because the festival has a very short window between the festival ending and starting to plan the next festival. And, and we just weren't able to get ready in time. Um, you know, it's it's one thing to answer the questions, but to actually do the things that you're saying that you're doing in these documents can, can be quite a bit of work. It can be pretty daunting and it really yeah. touches every aspect of your business. So we did everything we could. Um, we made progress over the window of opportunity we had there, but we eventually in the end lost the deal. Uh, we continued to work on it over the festival season, over the summer, and got ourselves in tip-top shape for the next uh, sort of sales cycle. But by then, uh, the organization had had moved on and, and found another solution to their problem. So our window of opportunity essentially closed. Um, we never got that back. So mm. that one hurt. Ouch. Yeah. yeah. You also have that story, right? That 
something. But at least you learned from it and that was led to other opportunities, right? I would have uh, rather have learned it from maybe like a $10,000 deal. But that's hey. true. That's true. That's true. I agree. <laughs> cool. And then what was the opportunity you saw? What was the problem that motivated you in the, that you saw in the market so clearly to start the, your company Securacy where you run today? Yeah. So, you know, after we got through that, that challenge and we finally built a security program, it, it took a lot of energy. We spent a lot of money in consultants. We read a lot of different stuff. Um, it, it was challenging because a lot of traditional security thought and a lot of security content out there was, especially at that time back in 2013, 2014, was really focused on the enterprise environment. So we had to do a lot of work to try to really understand what controls made sense in our business. Um, a lot of traditional things like, um, you know, worrying about the local network and stuff like that, where we're heavily work from home and stuff like that. There was just very different beast. And so we did a lot of thinking. We, we came up with some, some interesting ways to secure the company. We realized as we started, you know, working with larger festivals and getting, getting more security questionnaires that this wasn't a one-off thing. This was really the future. And at that point, there was a lot of rumblings about the inevitable GDPR, which was coming down the, uh, you know, coming down the pipeline and, and rumors of other privacy regulations around the world. Um, and that just led us to think, you know what, this is a really good position for us to take to be the secure option in the space. We had some young up and coming companies coming after us and, and they didn't have security, a security posture that they could brag about. So we really decided to go over the overboard with it, really vamp our security up. We did, we had a, a certified audit on the company. So we had a SOC 2 audit uh, done um, for us. And, and I went on to study cybersecurity um, after after hours and weekends, did my CISSP, which is a, a certification. You write a really long exam about uh, just about everything to do with cybersecurity. It was a really challenging uh, endeavor, but got that. It was funny when I posted that on my LinkedIn, I had a whole bunch of my friends that were also startup founders for other um, event tech companies hitting me up on, on, on message and being like, you know, can you help us? We're getting all these questionnaires. So it was really clear to me that like we had figured out as a startup how to present Present ourselves in a way that 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 demonstrated assurance that made uh, that that showed that our risk was low and that we really took looking after customer data seriously. It was mm -hmm. obvious to me that this was something other people were struggling um, with and. Mm -hmm. Being a person who likes big, complex problems, like the problem we solved in the festival space around logistics, I, I saw this as somewhat of a logistical or an information-based problem. So, uh, you know, I just started getting obsessed with the idea, um, and it was, you know, on the, on the back burner. And, and as I started moving towards selling Mercado. Um, mm -hmm. I was really at that point already certain, certain to draft this up and had a few people recruited on the side and was sort of quietly strumming up um, the security mission. Um, so yeah, it was, you know, it was just the, I guess it's the classic thing you, you, you encounter and feel the problems that you have in your own work and life. And yeah. I think that's why so many entrepreneurs, basically they build businesses from those problems because, you know, they have that unique experience of, of living those problems. Exactly. It's from your actual experience. So you sell Mercado, you're in that process and then, or, you know, you did exit. And then from there you start, you know, drumming up this idea, you're learning about it, you're, you know, putting together, uh, you know, data, putting together, uh, you know, your training and learning. And then you also start building out your team. Um, at what point did you guys decide and what was the process of building like an actual SaaS, um, you know, from idea to actual launch? Did you have that experience as a, a tech founder or did you have a, a, a tech co-founder with you? Um, now, what were some like initial costs to get it off the ground? Yeah, so uh, both my founder and I, uh, my co-founder and I, neither of us are, are tech founders per se. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I have the the technology expertise around the cyberspace, but in terms of uh, you know a CTO or an engineer, we had a, we actually uh, started it with hiring a, a UX designer because we mm -hmm. believed that you know the the opportunity was to create something new and slick and very user friendly, which was at the time certainly uh, something we felt was lacking in the security space. Um, and, and we, we brought in a consultant who had done some work, uh, in, in Mercado. And so it's kind of funny cause, uh, the UX guy, our first employee was, um, a, 
a previous Mercado uh, UX employee. And my co-founder was the head of sales at uh, Mercado. And then the consultant we brought in to start building the technology was was doing this as sort of a part-time project initially. And he was uh, also somebody who came to me as a consultant who helped us with some technical architecture issues at Mercado in the past. So uh, that was really sort of the, the, initial, the initial team. And then we just started adding developers in. But I would say like, you know, mm-hmm. for us, we were developing software before we entirely knew what we were building we were we knew certain things so we knew that security needed policies and we knew that in order for people to read policies and sign off on policies we needed login credentials and we so we were just really building like the platform the skeleton of a very generic tool initially and then in the meantime we had built some data collection pieces um, that that were I think originally built in HubSpot actually so my co-founder and I were building this stuff out and um, and and essentially what we were doing is sort of wizard of ozing uh, the one of the modules of the tool. So we had this idea that, hey, you answer 30 or 40 questions. And from that, we'll be able to build a set of security policies for your organization. And so um, it it looked like we had a magical tool in the background that was doing that. But really what was happening is you'd fill out all the questions and then we'd get an alert. And then we would like, we had like a document in Google Docs with like all these variables. And we had like, if if they answered, you know, this question this way, it meant this. And and we would just go with Wizard of Oz it. And, you know, you'd, we had this disclosure like, hey, because this is a beta technology, you'll get your policies in 24 hours. And, mm-hmm. and we use that as an experience um, to really sort of figure out, c- could we build a, a a, a, a good policy builder where you would feel like you actually had a set of policies built that were unique to your business that okay. weren't just like a template with your name and address filled in. And, right. and that was a really interesting experiment. Um, and, and then we just started really building from that. Um, initially, I think we, I think our first, we did like a really small family and friends round. It was about $150,000 that gave okay. us the ability to pay uh, wages for a couple of months to just sort of like test the idea. One of the thing that we, one of the interesting things that we did in the testing process is we, we charge money for it. So we, we wanted to prove that we could, that people would pay and figure out how much they'd pay. And we did all kinds of experiments. We'd start off at a really small sum and then just keep driving it up until people were like, whoa, this is expensive. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, that, that gave us a lot of insight in terms of what we were going to build. And then it really sort of, it sort of went from the policies. So in 2018, we, we went out and we raised again, another small round. We raised a, a like about half a million bucks, um, again, just to keep the lights on, keep working on it and figuring it out. And then mm. in 2019, when we launched, we, we went out and raised about 1.5 million bucks. Um, and that, um, that gave us, you know, a team just to actually really start diving in and, and building the product. And we nice. did like, I think what most startups do is you launch a product when it's kind of not really quite where you want it, but uh, you, you got to get it out there and you got to start proving it in market and you got to start getting really cu- real customers that aren't like your friends or your mom or somebody like that, that will give you legit feedback without any uh, candy coating. So. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think that's, that's kind of a common issue, right? That people face is they, they take too long and they're, they're waiting for everything to be perfect, but we need to get that feedback as, as soon as possible. Um, so for, for those who are in our audience or maybe, you know, early stages or they don't clearly understand, you know, this, this space, can you explain what, you know, SaaS data security is, the risk and compliances are? Uh, why is it important? Why should SaaS founders make sure that they get that right? Yeah. So if it, to, to define what, uh, you know, whether you call it data security or cybersecurity or information security, these are all terms that are thrown around. Uh, now we have data privacy in there, which generally refers to privacy regulations. Um, essentially, the, the information security is um, basically anything that, that protects confidentiality, integrity, or availability of information. So, mm-hmm. Inherently, I think every startup, every CTO, every technical founder or developer has some sense of it to a degree. So, you know, you you obviously know that you want to have backups because if something bad happens, you want to make sure that you still have availability, you still have your customer's data and, and, and you're generally doing things to ensure uptime. I mean, it's obviously not a good look when your web app goes down for a day, especially if it's a critical service. Um, But, but really, you know, Unfortunately, a lot of startups, you're, you're generally thinking about 
figuring out what are you building, trying to build it quick. It's never quick enough. Everything takes like way more time and money. Every time I've never seen people say, hey, we're going to build this thing in two weeks or we're going to build this feature in a month and do it. It's very rare that it happens on time. So you run into snags, you got a lot of pressure. Um, You know, obviously as a startup, you're you're always working against the clock. So you're spending money uh, trying to get your product to a point where you can validate it and, and have customers pay for it, either to generate money so you can pay your your bills and your wages or, or to raise that next round of capital. So so unfortunately, because of that pressure and, 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 and all those other, you know, big projects that are looming on sort of your business succeeding or not, cybersecurity or data security generally doesn't have any formal um, sort of articulation. And, and, and the problem that creates is you end up writing more and more code. So if there's any bad, bad practices that you have, or if you architect things without thinking of all the elements of security, the problem that happens when you're, say, at $2 million in ARR, and you're like, okay, well, we need to pass an audit or we need to do this thing, is that you have all this technical debt you may not have even had real, really had an inventory of. So you have all of this sort of accumulative code and architectural decisions and product design decisions that, that could negatively affect you. And so, you know, I think traditionally... Um, there wasn't a whole lot of pressure on startups. Like when I think about launching my first SaaS in 2010, yeah. uh, very rarely got, you know, you got really weird questions like, you know, what's the cloud or like, what's this? People would say things like, <laughs> what is the security like without really knowing what they're talking about? That has changed so much. Like if you're selling now to upper mid market or to enterprise right now, like it doesn't matter if you're a two person SaaS or a hundred person SaaS, you are not going to be able to sell a product that, that touches any customer data of any level of confidentiality, like even simple things like names and phone numbers of their employees or addresses or stuff like that. I mean, you're just not going to be, they're going to want to go put you through a process, a third party risk and due diligence process where they're going to ask you a lot of really pointed questions. And I go through this with my customers all the time. Honestly, most of our customers come to us too late. They come to us when they're just at the verge of potentially losing that big deal that I've experienced. And, Mm. And they've wait it too long they've, they've and they have that buildup of, of technical debt so it's not like you can just flick a couple of switches uh, and, and automatically have your company secure and and just to be more clear um, you know there's there's in, in most startups there's a couple of key components like obviously your SaaS is 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 predominantly your largest and most valuable asset. That's usually where most of your customer data resides. So that is a big piece, obviously, of any security or compliance exercise. But you also have requirements um, like background checking of employees. You need to make sure that the the laptops are secure, that there's some sort of endpoint point protection. You need to make sure there's training and awareness and there's written documents and there's, there's a process and there's very clear articulation of the importance of security in the organization. So um, yeah, it does take some work, but it, this, the sooner you do it, the earlier in your in your business you do it, the, the less work it is. If it's something that's thought of from day one and is just incorporated, even not as a predominant thing, but just as a thing. So you have some, you know, you have a couple of lunch and learns, you focus on secure development practices and you're thinking about security by design in your application uh, and just sort of developing the, those, those good practices right from the beginning, then when you have that big proof of concept with your ideal customer, you're going to look sophisticated and, and responsible. You're not going to be caught mm. uh, in that. Like I see so many founders being caught, not even understanding half of the questions that the vendors asking them around their data security. Sure, sure. So you mentioned that most of them will come to you probably at a, at a, at a point where it might be just a little bit too late than you'd like, um, or just makes it a lot more complicated at that point. At what point do you suggest that a SaaS company or founder really start thinking about that cybersecurity and data privacy? Is that from still day one or you know, I would, once you have that client? You know? Absolutely. I think it makes I make it makes sense to do it at day one. If you are doing it because when the customer's on the door, um, you're, you're in a bad spot. And the re, I think about it, like you, you've got this communication going on where you're back and forth, your sales team, everything's quick, you're being responsive, you're doing all the best stuff. Then they send you a security questionnaire. And now it takes you two weeks to respond. Like it, it, it's very clear to that auditor that your your delay in responding is an indication of the fact that you're looking at this going, oh, yeah, <laughs> oh. I didn't think about that. So, so so you don't want to wait on, on until you have to do it. 
Mm. Believe me that you will have to do it. And I think when we when we started working in, in the cyberspace or looking at it, it was mostly like health tech, fintech areas where there's a higher degree of, of um, um, you know, critical or, or very protected information, uh, confidential information. Now it's really anything. And, and all these privacy laws like GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation in Europe, CCPA in California, PEPIDA in Canada, and there's others, uh, you know, coming down the pipeline as well. They're all influencing that as well. Well, and they're creating, they're forcing large organizations to, to reevaluate their entire data program. And of course, to look at their, their, they have to look at their vendors because if they're using a SaaS vendor, they need to make sure that that vendor is, is not taking them out of compliance or not introducing new risks to the. Right. What, what are some typical breaches that you see, um, you know, from common, common around SaaS companies, uh, yeah, just what what are they really seeing there? Um, so you know, there's there's a, there's always the case that the lower profile you are, which generally as an early stage co- company, you're much more low profile. Generally, when when you're very low profile, there's there's less targeted hits towards. Uh, your organization. As you start increasing your profile, as you market yourself and your brand, while you're marketing that to your customers, you're also marketing that to hackers. So as you start being noisier, there's more likelihood that you're going to have more sophisticated or more targeted attacks. Um, Or if you start selling or landing deals with with, um, very reputable and noisy customers. Uh, So in our case at Mercado, I mean, we had, you know, we had Coachella logos and Burning Man logos logos on our website. So, um, you know, if you were really trying to take down Coachella, uh, you would look at who are their vendors, right? So that, that really, uh, you know, points, points to, um, to your company in that regard. Um, but you know, the, the most common things that we see in early stage companies, uh, de- uh, basically generic attacks where people are just just circling around looking for vulnerabilities in websites using a bot of some sort. They find that your website or your server is using an old version of TLS or something like that that they can they can inf- that there's a, a you know a, an attack vector they can they can take advantage of to gain access or they do input validation testing and, and your tool fails or your web app fails that they go and they do some sort of hack where maybe they get the whole whole database. Um, and a lot of times, most of the time, startups don't know when this happens because what will happen is it gets released in the dark in the dark web down the road. And it's usually in a combination of, of multiple hacks. So they may hack like a thousand companies or a hundred companies and then pull that together as a big data set and then sell that data set in the dark wow. web. So it's not like you're going to find it because somebody's like, hey, uh, Securities data is for sale in the dark web. It'll be some random name by some random uh, hacker um, that's available. And and, and, you know, if you don't have the monitoring tools, you're not doing any sort of threat monitoring or dark web monitoring, you may never find out that you've been hacked. So so, so, I'd, so I would, you know, take a, a guess that there's a lot of companies out there that have been hacked that don't know it. And then, you know, the other ones, the ones that we see people feel the most as early stage, um, um, denial of service, so dedicated denial of service, DDoS attacks uh, happen um, happen. Often enough, um, there are tools out there that you can put in place that that reduce that, the, the likelihood of that. Um, but to be totally honest, the thing I see the most often is is internal error is the largest compromise and most or lar- largest known compromise that I see in SaaS companies. So that is lack of proper code testing or, Q- or quality of service before code is shipped to master. And so you have a developer who's really tired pumping out a deadline at the end of the day for a customer and they push a piece of code and then they out the door, they head out for beer. And then all of a sudden phones start going off because now, uh, you know, CPU is crashing or overloading because there was some random piece of code that because there wasn't proper testing in play um, or they were cutting corners in that regard. Now this thing's taking the web app down. So you're doing your own, your own denial of service internally by a, a developer, uh, overtired developer error. Or, you know, another one that I've seen is a cases where, you um, the proper checks and balances aren't being had and there's not enough sort of test-driven uh, code in, in in your code base and somebody deploys something that actually um, allows for privilege ex- escalation. So maybe somebody who's not supposed to have access to financial information in your organization and your CRM now has access to that. Um, right. Or, you know, a customer is able to see something they're not supposed to see. So we see a right. lot of that uh, and that can be very embarrassing and problematic and even cause legal, um, you know, legal outcomes. But 
we end up investigating a lot of scenarios um, uh, with SaaS companies, especially young SaaS, co- SaaS companies that don't have those practices in place. Right. Yeah, that, that's because I never thought of that. Like people, you know, stealing your database and then selling it on the dark web, and as you wouldn't find out, and then until you see maybe a, a copy, <laughs> a copycat show up with the exact yeah. same code, that'd be crazy. But again, uh, like I think, you know, I think the most important thing is that whether you think you are susceptible to being hacked or not, um, it, it, it's it's still is it, if you think you're not going to be hacked and you think you're secure enough, but you still don't have a formal security program, it's that's not going to be enough to satisfy most customers nowadays. So mm-hmm. if you're if if you're not concerned about your low profile and and the chance of being hacked per se, um, you should certainly be concerned about uh, how problematic it's going to be in your sales process very early mm-hmm. on. Got it. So if I'm a SaaS founder, this is maybe something I haven't thought about or, you know, early stage, either I am in day one or I'm a little bit more advanced, but now I really want to start, you know, considering this and start implementing. How do you recommend they start, you know, building, framing and documenting that comprehensive centralized strategy for achieving, you know, data privacy compliance for their clients? Yeah. And and so, you know, data privacy is being the piece where is the is the legal component where you're essentially protecting um, data in in compliance with privacy regulations. Um, you know, uh, there's there's it, it, that's a thing that you can talk to your your legal counsel about making sure you understand uh, what compliance requirements you have before you start taking on large amounts of data, especially when you get into personally identifiable information or health health information or stuff like that. I think you know at the bare minimum, um, the the thing that I would recommend um, startup founders to do is to start prioritizing security from day one in their in their product team. I would introduce the product team to the Open Web Application Security Project, OWASP.org. Um, and there's there's what's called the OWASP Top 10. It's a great resource. It's totally free. They can go and they can download guides. They can read uh, about that. They, they can start putting lunch and learns together. I would make clear that, that you know, developing code, you know, you, you generally say, well, hey, I want stuff on time. I want it to be fast. I want it to look good. Uh, add in, you want it to be secure. And the reason I say that is because, you know, it's it's very quick and easy for a small SaaS company to deploy endpoint protection or, or to put certain policies in effect in their organization. But, but, fa- but writing, architecting an app and designing a whole entire product and putting all that Re- those resources into it and not thinking about it securely is is a massive oversight. And like I say, that does create a, ma- a lot of technical debt. And, and in most cases, when we have um, software companies that are coming to us with their hair on fire because they have a big deal on the doorstep and they're trying to answer the security questionnaire in five days, um, the, the areas where we end up getting caught up and where we end up losing time and losing ground are often on the application side. So, you know, you could deploy endpoint protection on all your endpoints tomorrow. You can send around a hard hardening image or a policy for hardening laptops very quickly, but you can't pass a pen test necessarily very quickly if you have been building code without security um, as, a, as a thought in that whole process. So some lunch and learns, uh, making it clear that it's important and and get some vulnerability scanning and, and out there, like, like make sure you're scanning the app and, and thinking about having a pen test before you go to market. Those would be some things I would definitely consider uh, doing right out of the gate. Even just those conversations. We're always talking about like things that are important. If security is not something we talk about is important, then it's just not going to happen. Makes sense. You just have to make it a priority. Um, do you ever have companies, you know, uh, you know, pointing the finger at you or your tool for the reason for for problems or those breach after uh, after the fact, rather than having that that plan? I haven't, but. You know, I, I think we're pretty transparent parent on the limitations of, um, you know, of, of what a tool or what advice can do. And, and so, True. you know, we're giving context around ways you can you can operate more in, in a more safe way. Um, it doesn't it, it doesn't eliminate entirely that 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 the, there could be an accident or, or a misstep for sure. Um, yeah, I, I kind of make it, it it's kind of similar to to driving, right? Like, you know, if you have, if you don't change your tires and you don't wear seatbelts and you don't follow the rules of the road and, you know, don't get your car inspected, there's, you're certainly more likely in, to get in a car accident than if you follow the rules. So, but you still sure. can get in a car accident if you follow the rules. So I, I've never had um, a scenario. I've never had a case of that happening. Um, 
you know, security, everything you do increases the, ch- like every security control you deploy in your organization is going to help prevent certain attack vectors. Uh, but there's no like silver bullet per se. Got it. Um, so if a company, you know, they do have some kind of security breach, right? They start, they end up usually, you know, losing that trust of whether it's their customers or, or their, or the market. Um, what is some, be- you know, some things and some best practices or things they can do uh, to help you regain that trust of, of that customer in the market and try to, you know, uh, yeah, win them back? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, for a lot of companies that have a breach, uh, that moment of having that that breach is the moment where they actually, uh, you know, really start taking security very, very seriously. Um, right. I think, I think the the worst case scenario, and we see it all the time, is cases where people try to cover it up or hide about it, or uh, you know, they're not being transparent or honest about it. Um, that's the the worst case scenario, um, and, and, and it happens a lot. Um, I recently got a, an email from a vendor saying, you know, we're changing our security practices. We ask you kindly to change, uh, you know, we recommend you change your password. Now I found out earlier that day using a, a dark web monitoring tool that, that, that their entire user base was available on the dark web for sale for a couple of, uh, you know, fraction of a Bitcoin type of thing. And so, oh. you know, not being transparent about that. And then all of a sudden you get written up in a big uh, cyber article about, about not being transparent. So that's when you really lose a lot of trust. I think you need to come, you know, you need to be honest and say, what's the scenario? What happened? Uh, Be honest with your customers. And then I think if you haven't already put a solid security program together and a really good security page on your website, then that's a really great opportunity to up your game substantially. Um, People will forget about the breach over time, um, generally. I mean, obviously it does depend on how bad it was, but, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's an unfortunate situation, but the best thing to do is to be honest and 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 afterward to really articulate, uh, uh, improve and articulate your security improvements. Mm. So if, if I'm trying to model a good strategy, right, the, a good kind of process and program in place, what does that look like uh, from data protection for customers and employees? And then do you have any any tips or tools that people can start, you know, using and implementing today to improve their, their process, whether that's personally or for their business? Yeah. And I, I mentioned the OWASP project. I think that's a great right. um, tool for any developer in any organization of any size, just mm-hmm. to become, start becoming more aware of, of, of secure development practices. Um, you know, I think, I think having your dev team make sure your product team is building a secure product is, is definitely very important for SaaS companies, in my opinion. Um, I think it's also really critical that the, the leader, like the CEO, the founders of the company lead by example. If, if you don't practice good hygiene from a security perspective, or you don't demonstrate that you care about security, then that means the company doesn't care. And that's how everybody else will be. So a little bit of awareness around that um, on the leadership side, it doesn't hurt to have some simple policies in place early. They're very very easy to construct. Um, you know, I'd have to, we built a tool specifically for SaaS companies. So, I mean, we, we have a free, we have a free tool as well that you can go on there and it starts, it, you can use that to start building your first, uh, your first couple of security policies around your business. So you can go to security.app and, 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 and sign up for a free account and use that. I mean, having some documentation and, and just, be leading it with clarity and by example and making sure your product is thinking about it is a great start. Now, when you're starting to get ready to um, pitch to customers or get ready to do a POC proof of concept or, or bring on real customers, um, you know, you're going to, at that point, you're going to need to look at having something more formal. In that case, you're going to need a full set of policies around your HR practices, around endpoints and, and how they're managed around passwords and, and, and credentialing and, and secure development and testing and all that kind of stuff. So at that point, you're going to want to start thinking about uh, benchmarking against a security framework or a security standard. Uh, there's a lot of them out there. Um, the right one kind of depends on your industry and who you're selling to. There's things like ISO 20. 7001. There's the Center for Internet Security, CIS Security Controls. There's U.S. government uh, NIST controls, 800-171, uh, CMMC. There's, there's a whole bunch of them. And depending on the industry you're in, um, you know, it does make sense to figure out what are the compliance, what, what compliance uh, benchmarks are they benchmarking against? What are they looking for in their customers? So that's a really you know, important piece of research when you're thinking about researching in your sales process, who you're 
you're selling to. Also understanding what those security and privacy requirements are going to look like. I mean, you might be a U.S. company selling to a U.S. company and think that GDPR is not something of concern. But if that right. U.S. company has you know 20% of its uh, users are in Europe or Euro- European citizens, then they're going to be uh, having language in their contract or in their security due diligence uh, around um, your GDPR compliance. And they're going to want to make sure that by storing data in your platform that they're not jeopardizing their own compliance. So doing mm-hmm. that research before you go to market uh, and then making sure that you you talk to a, somebody who understands security compliance and can prepare you. You say you don't want to be in that situation where you've done all this hard work and now you're standing in front of a, a really nice, sweet deal with an ideal customer um, and, and they're asking you for your, your ISO uh, you know, 27001 compliance and you're sitting there going, what is ISO 27001? <laughs> um, you know, there's there, there's a lot of controls in a security framework like that. Most security frameworks are anywhere between 100 and 260, some controls. Um, you need to validate your non-applicability. Uh, you need to comply. Or if you say no to any of those, you have to have a really good reason not to, not just you can't use things like, oh, we're just a startup. Like, exactly. they don't care about that. And um so, so yeah, that's, that's, that's the way I'd, I'd go about it. Start with sort of culture leadership, a little bit of basic foundational policy from day one, really focus on making sure your developers are thinking about incorporating security into what they do and what they read and, and what they, you know, spend their lunch and learns on. Um, and, and, and that, you know, helps you start a little bit of a security culture and certainly a, 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 like an aware group of people and, and reduces the likelihood of having a bunch of technical debt. And then, you know, when you're really getting ready to talk to customers, which I think, you know, for most SaaS companies nowadays is earlier than ever before. Um, you want to be talking to customers. So in that research, make sure you, you know what they're going to expect and that you're planning that into your budget. And and because and, otherwise you're going to be projecting a sale to close and it won't because you're not ready from the, the security or privacy side to uh, service that customer. Got it. Yeah, make, makes makes perfect sense. Uh, cool. So there, these are just a couple of questions to wrap up. Uh, more, you know, for, for for yourself. More curious. Uh, what are some biggest challenges you're currently facing and looking to overcome, and continuing to grow security? Yeah, you know. I think I think like right now we're we're sort of entering into a growth mode. We've we've really nailed product market fit over the last uh, you know within the last say eight or nine months. I feel like we've really figured that out, and and we've started hiring, uh, growing the team, bringing on um, dedicated sales and marketing resources. Um, mm-hmm. So now it's really going to be about recruiting, building a team. Um, this company is now entirely remote. We're predominantly in Nova Scotia, but we do have some team members outside of Nova Scotia. We have a couple of people in Boston. And I think, you know, as we're starting to recruit and more people and grow the team, um, it's going to be really interesting in a new sort of paradigm for me in terms of how I recruit people and how I build a company. I'm, I'm definitely, uh, you know, spend a lot of time with mostly people in the office or at least a lot of the core people in the office. So I think that'll be a bit of a challenge uh, re- going about raising our first round of capital without it being a roadshow is, is kind of interesting. Um, sure. So yeah, I look forward to that too. But uh, yeah, I mean, the other thing I think like, I think this day and age, there's just so many more startups than there ever, ever were before. Right. Um, and there's more starting all the time. So generally, like if you have a really good idea, I think that there's a whole lot of other people that also have that really good idea as well. So like the competitive sure. landscapes um, de- develop and evolve much more quickly than they used to. So um, that's, you know, another interesting challenge that we'll be, we'll be uh, dealing with over the next couple of months and years. Nice. So you got a little bit of pressure to, to yeah. innovate a little quicker. Yeah, that's nice. You got it. Nice, nice. Um, Darren, who or what have been three you know resources? It could be books and or people who like, you know, mentors or influencers or people you follow who you say have been instrumental to your success over the last few years. Yeah, I mean, you know, I definitely have a, have a lot of different. I've had a lot of mentors over the years that have that have been great. Um, you know, doing the the TechStars Boston program and getting introduced to a ton of people there has been really helpful. Um, you know, re- read quite a few books. Um, I think. I think for me, some of the books that I, I've kind of gone back to and looked at again are, are sort of modeled into some, some of the, you know, corporate culture and leadership of the business. One is The Advantage um, by Patrick Lencioni. 
Okay. Um, that was a book that I, I read it, really liked it, implemented some things from it, went back, sort of leveraged it again. Another one in that same context was Developing the Leader Within You by John C. Maxwell. Those are two serious, like really good books to to think about when you're sort of, you know, building... Um, building your own leadership skills and then trying to like help other people in your organization that lead departments build their skills as you're growing. And, and, you know, um, I think reading those books has also sort of opened my mind to the concept of having a coach. And then I watched a couple of documentaries where that were, you know, they're talking about the, like sports documentaries. They're talking about the value of the coach. And I'm like paralyzed, paralleling this to like, you know, how a coach could be super effective as an entrepreneur and start, you know, start really thinking about myself as like, you know, getting up in the morning to perform every day in the same way, like, you know, an athlete would, uh, would do that. And so like, start thinking about, it got me thinking more about like taking care of yourself to be able to perform. Like, you know, you can't, you, you can't imagine like, you know, an NBA basketball player is not going to go out and drink all night and, and then like get up in the morning and go have, have the, you know, maybe there's a few out there that can do that, but I'd say for the most part, like, you know, you get that good night's sleep, you stretch, you, you look after yourself, right? You eat well, you, you do all these things, right? So, um, you know, really trying to, to, to create like discipline in what I do. And now I'm bringing in a coach. I'm about to work with my first coach in the new year. So pretty stoked about, uh, about taking that on. And, you know, I think being, a, being the, the more like the, as you build your, your team more, uh, your role, it changes substantially, right? And you hear lots of stories about CEOs sort of stepping down from the CEO role at a certain point in the growth trajectory um, because they need a professional CEO. And, and, and for me, like, you know, I, I really, uh, I'm really engaged in the challenge and, and I'm, I'm looking forward to sort of the transitioning and, and having, you know, having my role evolve in, in that regard as much as it can. Um, you know, when you're, when you're just a couple of co like a couple of co-founders and a couple of employees, you're kind of doing everything, right? Right. Like you're like, you know, you're cleaning the toilets, you're mopping the floor, you're like ordering paper, you're like, you know, you're selling and you're doing product stuff, you're doing quality of service, you're doing customer support. You're really like, you know, and so like the skill set there is very different. Like when you have a couple of hundred employees, it's a very different um, scenario. Right. So I think, exactly. I think, you know, those are great books that have been really helpful to me and, and help me think about sort of that continual sort of personal and professional grow, growth as a leader. Nice. Uh, I haven't read, but I'm a big, sorry, big fan of John, John Wax, Maxwell, uh, but we'll add those links to the show notes. Uh, cool. I actually think that's one of the most underrated, uh, you know, skill sets or, or I think skill sets, right? And habits that you develop people of, you know, looking internally to become better as CEOs and leaders versus, you know, people looking externally. I think, uh, you know, in developing those habits of taking care of your mind and, and your, your, sorry, your mindset and your body. And then, you know, that'll, that's kind of the, the foundation that builds, that you can build upon to get better and better. Right. And I um, think it gives you the ability to, to like make, build a company that people like to work at more. So mm-hmm. like, you know, when you're just constantly squeezing everybody and pushing everybody all the time, and there's like, you know, there's no consideration for their well being, And it, it's not necessarily malicious. I, I, I've been there before in, you know, in the early days of Mercado, you're treating yourself that way. So you don't really feel like you're being True. an idiot to these people you're just like you're you know you just you're under the gun you're under this pressure and you just feel like the only way to get through it is to just like like harder 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 like humans mm-hmm. can only work so hard for so long Sure. And I think if you can like, if you can actually sort of break down some of the barriers, be a great leader, get people to start thinking and learning about themselves and getting better and, and then think about like, okay, well, you're coming to work, you're going to work for 10 hours today. But like really getting people to start be being better at doing the right things and, and using their time better and, and, and coming in more prepared and being more effective and respecting their time, like respect their time off, give them vacation time, like let them have, you know, if there's more to life than work. And also like you can, I, I know we've all been in this position where we're like sitting there late at night trying to do something. You're writing an email that's taking you like 30 minutes. If you just w- woke up, like went and slept for eight hours and got up, had a cup of coffee and a nice breakfast and attacked it in the morning morning, you'd write that same email in like five minutes. So like, why are you, why are you still there? You know, yeah, um, you know, so I think, I think it does like, I, I think it, it helps build a culture that, that people want to be and people want to be effective. People want to do really good work and they want to be part of a winning team, but they also, you know, they want that balance and they want to feel like their job isn't taking over their entire existence. Right. So, which exactly. can happen in startups. 
<laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's part of the sometimes part of the game. Um, so you know, obviously had some good success, had an exit. Uh, today, what would you say success means to you, whether it's personally, financially, business wise? Yeah, you know, I think like there's definitely the uh, a situation of diminishing returns with money. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you, it, it, you're, you're going to be a lot happier if you're making a hundred thousand dollars than if you're making $50,000 a year. Um, I, I think like from a hundred to 200, uh, that's a, it's, it's not as you're not going to not, it's not going to be that much of an improvement from like 200 to 2 million. It just gets to a point where like, you know, what, how much, you know, how much money do you need to have to have a really good life? Right. So, um, you know, I think, I think for me, um, uh, I'm I'm motivated by having enough money to retire and 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 live well and and have you know have some toys and have some freedom there, um, but honestly, one of the things that that sort of pushes me to to build a big company and and to be able to have a really big exit at the end is is I think you know post this startup, I would love to be able to contribute more to my region and to be able to help more technology startup founders grow. And so, you know, I really look at, at, at having a big exit as, 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 a, as a, a big event for not just myself, but for the community and for, you know, it would give me the ability to, to invest in other, in other startups and also to set an example. Uh, we just recently had a company, Verifin, out of Newfoundland. Now, Newfoundland is like, no offense to any uh, Newfoundland listeners here, but, you know, Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia is pretty far off the map, but Newfoundland is like, you have to get on a ferry from Cape Breton and go about six hours out to sea to get oh, yeah. to Newfoundland. I mean, yes, you can fly there, obviously. But um, this company is a multi-billion-dollar acquisition, right? So, yeah, I think we we always sort of have this belief that you need to be in Silicon Valley or you need to be in New York or you need to be in a big city. Um, so, I think it's great seeing a success like the Verifin. I'd love to have another big success like that come out of Cape Breton here. Mm, I think cool. it just sort of sets the stage and it and it shows people that you know you can do anything you want pretty much from anywhere nowadays. Um, so that's that's really something that motivating me to build build a big company for sure. Very cool. Yeah, I think there's a, another company I know, Pro- Proposify. I think they're from the east coast of uh, yeah. Canada as well. Yeah. Yeah. So that's another one. Kyle Racky. Yeah. Kyle Racky. Exactly. Yeah. He's a pretty good yeah, entrepreneur. Yeah. 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 Great company. Cool. cool. Um, thanks. So thanks, Darren, for jumping on SAS District. Uh, how can our audience get in touch with you and learn more about what you're working on? Yeah, so you can you can reach out to me at Darren at security dot com. Uh, I'm available on email. It comes to my inbox. I might not get back to you right away, but I definitely will uh, respond in a, within a couple of days. So that's the best way to hit me. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for jumping on, Darren. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank right, you. Cheers. Take cheers. care. Thank you all for watching this episode and joining SAS District today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell for future episodes where we interview top leaders in the SaaS industry. If you're a SaaS company looking to grow and unlock the true value of your business, get in touch with us at Horizon Capital and myself or one of our consultants will provide a free assessment to help you get there and hit your goals. If you have any feedback or suggestions for this podcast, please comment down below and help us improve our content for you all. Thanks again and see you on the next one.